Hello and welcome to a new episode of Talking Law from Women in the Law UK. I'm Sally Penny, MBE, Barrister at Kenworthy's Chambers in Manchester, Joint Vice Chair of the Association of Women Barristers and the founder of Women in the Law UK. You can find out more about the work I do at womeninthelawuk.com, including webinars covering subjects from building confidence to managing your career and managing your finances. There are so many different areas to explore, all of which are available to watch again on YouTube and listen again as a podcast. There's also a series of Talking Law books which are available to buy on Amazon, all sales going to charity. The latest, Talking Law 3, which celebrates diversity in the law. You can also find other books written by me, Sally Penny, on employment law, data protection and criminal law, all of which are available on Amazon. Today, I'm talking law with someone who is not a lawyer, but a campaigner. Regular listeners will know there are very few non-lawyers who appear on this podcast. Gina Miller, Dame Tanny Gray-Thompson, Maxine Peake, but to name just a few. But every now and again, it's fascinating for me to interview somebody who is just as passionate about the law as I am about practicing law. Jolie Brilly is author of the book Pregnant Then Screwed, The Truth About Motherhood Penalty and How to Fix It. She also heads up the campaign and charity by the same name, speaking up for mothers who have been penalised in the workplace. I started by asking Jolie how the whole campaign started. When I was four months pregnant with my first child, I informed my employer that I was pregnant and the next day they sacked me by voicemail. And my employer was a children's charity. So that experience obviously was a complete shocker. Not only had I been sacked, I then felt I'd be unable to get another job because I was four months pregnant. So I was showing, I tried to do something about it. I, um, I called a number of helplines, but didn't feel I got the help that I needed ended up getting a solicitor to support me. They wrote the charity a letter to demand I be compensated. The charity just threw that letter in the bin. That process cost me £250. And when you've no idea where your next paycheck is coming from, hemorrhaging that type of money is terrifying. Then the lawyer said to me, okay, look, your next stage would be to take them to court. I said, how much is that going to cost me? They said, well, it's a pretty complicated case. So it could be, you know, about, it's probably going to be about £9,000. That's a wage, isn't it, in some sectors? Who on earth? I don't know anybody that has £9,000 just sloshing around in their bank account for a rainy day. Certainly I didn't and I was about to have a baby and I had no income. So I said, okay, I'll think about it. And the next day I went for a routine hospital appointment, was told I was having a high risk pregnancy. My cervix had almost vanished and they said, look, your baby is hanging on by a thread. And if you go into labor now, the baby will die. So they rushed me into surgery to do this delightful process where they tried to bolt my cervix together to keep the baby in place and after surgery they said look this may not work it's about a 25 percent success rate and so what you've got to do is reduce any stress in your life because it's stress that will trigger early onset labor and if the baby comes now the baby will die and as you only have three months less one day to raise a tribunal claim from the point the discrimination occurs I couldn't wait until I'd had my baby he's fine he's a very healthy seven-year-old thankfully and then pick the case up at a later date so I was forced to drop it I was literally given the choice between the health of my unborn child or the justice that I deserved Mm. and so I found myself pregnant unemployed unable to access justice thinking my baby was going to die lying on a sofa watching daytime telly thinking what's just what on earth has just happened and I'm now completely powerless. I have nothing. I have no income. I have no job. My my identity was so connected to my job. Yes. And partner had to pay my way, had to keep a roof over my head and food on my table. And all I was useful for was as a vessel for this growing fetus. And I wasn't even doing that very well. And that 
that process, that those three weeks and essentially radicalized me and they made me see the world in a very different way. And I became a fierce feminist and a year and a half later, it was still eating away at me. And so I set pregnant and screwed up as a place for women to tell their stories anonymously. That's how it started. And here we are six years later. Wow. Well, it is, um, a campaign, I guess, because you've now got 10,000 followers on Twitter. You've written a book, you're on Instagram, and really you are giving a voice to the voiceless, you know, and, and I practice in employment law. So I know precisely what you're talking about here when we're talking about, you know, sex discrimination and the protected characteristics. But did you ever envisage it to be what it's become? I just noticed that in addition to your Northern Power Women Award, you've just won an award. I think last night I saw, I'd finished a case and I, and I went on LinkedIn and saw you holding a trophy. What was that for? I was like, wow, another award. <laughs> All these, I'm going to need a cabinet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, the Sheila McKenzie Award for uh, Campaigner of the Year 2021, that one. I mean, in answer to your question, yeah, I never in a million years expected to end up here. And I think that's part of the beauty of it. It was very grassroots. It really, when it started, I genuinely wanted to expose these stories and I wanted to connect with other women that had had a similar experience to me because that was cathartic. Mm. And then all these women got in touch and started telling their stories. And then it just sort of mushroomed and the media became interested. And as soon as we did our first TV interview, then these stories just started flooding in. And I, I guess I thought when I first started it that once we expose these stories, I call it my waiting for a hero moment. I expected somebody to come in on a horse and go, oh, now we can see that this this problem, oh, well, we'll fix it. We just yeah. didn't know it was there. Yes. Um, and of course, that was very naive. And I realized there was nobody on a horse coming to save the day. And so then that's when the campaigning started. And we started really banging down Parliament's doors to say, what are you doing? Why are you not fixing this problem? Yes. Now, um, you had a recent case, didn't you, which was taking the government to court, and it was about the discriminatory nature of some of the COVID provisions, because what's uh, alerted from the Fawcett Society, who've been doing some surveys, and indeed you've been doing some research, which I'll come to, is that women have been disproportionately affected, for example, by COVID uh, and the COVID provisions. But what was the legal case about that you took the government to court over? It's a brave thing to do, to be, you know, a young mum feminist, and next you're bringing a case against the state. Well, I love that you call me a young mum. <laughs> the reason why we took the government's court was because we were so sick and tired of every policy, every bit of guidance that the government put forward. There was this baby blind spot. They completely forgot about pregnant women and mothers every single time. And we would alert them to it and we would be shouting and saying, hold on, you've forgotten pregnant women and mothers again. And sometimes they would rectify it. And in this time they didn't and they announced the self-employed income support scheme and the way that worked was to take your average earnings over the last three years and give you 80 percent of those earnings if you take maternity leave in the last three years your payment would be reduced by about a third probably a little bit more if you'd taken two maternity leaves in the last three years it would be at least two thirds so we were speaking to women whose payment they were getting was just, I mean, it was barely worth the paper it was written on, all because they had given birth to a baby and they'd done the most important job in the world, which is caring for that child. And it yeah. it was not fair when you compare it to men and you compare it to childless women. Why should women be doubly punished for having a baby and for looking after it? I mean, maternity leave pays appalling. It's £151 a week. You can't live on it. It's the third lowest pay in Europe. So to try and survive maternity leave on that terrible pay and then be punished again was just so excruciating. And we were we were livid and we genuinely thought at first they'll rectify this. They've just again forgotten about pregnant women. But we had various 
MPs bring this up in Parliament. And Ellie Reeves, who's a brilliant Labour MP, brought it up with Rishi Sunak um, in the House of Parliament. And Rishi's response was, everybody has ups and downs in earnings. It could be because of sick leave, sabbaticals or other, meaning maternity leave is the same as going on holiday or being unwell. And I mean, that was a red rag to a bull for us. How dare you? How dare you reduce the role of what women do to going on holiday? So uh, we wrote them a, the pre-action protocol letter. They confirmed that statement in their response. And then we thought, right, we're going to court. Mm. We did. But sadly, we lost. <laughs> yes. So how, how do you feel about that? I, I mean, and I suppose, could you see that that was going to be a loss in the sense that we're going through a pandemic? I'm playing devil's advocate here. You know, we're going through a pandemic. The government is trying to deal with all sorts of different aspects of, of, of the life and indeed the economy uh, and manage it. Could you see that actually maternity leave and women's rights, if you if you like, um might have been seen as sort of further down the food chain? Or did you think, actually, this is a decent government who understands the point and might well take it up? I, I appreciated that we were absolutely in an emergency and they had to get this scheme out quickly because there were hundreds of thousands of self-employed people who then didn't have an income, so they needed to move as fast as they could. And during the court case, they made a very good case for why um, making that that scheme equal could have meant that it was open to various problems. You know, people could have um, used the scheme when they weren't self-employed. There were all sorts of challenges they would have had to have overcome. However, the government has a legal responsibility to assess all of its schemes, to make sure they are equal to all types of people. And they clearly had not done that with this scheme. And so to me, it was it was as if they were just riding rough, roughshod over the Equality Act. And of course, yes, I appreciate that we were in an emergency, but they could have backtracked it at a later date. They could have said, OK, we've realised we've made this error and done something about it. But they didn't. They just continued to say, no, it's fine. There's nothing to see here. There's no problem. So there were sort of two claims, as it were, with that court case. And we, we, I had given it a 50-50 whether we would fail on the first claim, which is about whether it was reasonable to put that uh, scheme into place because we were in an emergency. And so we, fa you know, we failed as in they, the judge ruled that it was reasonable for them to have done it. And yeah. so you know, as we've discussed, I can sort of understand that, but I couldn't understand why we failed on the second because I did feel it was completely in breach of the Equality Act. And the judge's point essentially, I mean, obviously there's pages and pages and pages. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've read it. <laughs> essentially was that everybody was equally could equally access that scheme, which of course they could, but that wasn't the point. And that's not what equality is about. Of course, everybody can equally access it. It doesn't mean that, that the way the scheme had been set up is equal. So it's an equity versus equality argument to me. Yeah. So now we're, we're appealing it and because we hope that there'll be a judge that really understands equality law and gets what we're saying. And, yes. um, and we, again, I'm not sure we'll succeed on whether it was reasonable for them to have put that scheme in place, but we really want them to overturn the second ruling. That's why yes. we're appealing. Now, Jenny, um, throughout the pandemic, I've spent a lot of time advising women and minorities to the extent that I then wrote a book um, about basic employment rights. And one of the other things that have happened is the women have gone backwards. And the other thing that's happened is that you also wrote a book. So that's three things of significance. So I want to start by asking how your book came about and what it's about. And then I want to ask you about what's happened in the pandemic, really, to women, because we know the women have taken the brunt of the homeschooling and uh, how do you see that uh, correcting itself. So firstly, how did your book come about? A book agent contacted me about four years ago and said I think you can write a book and I said don't be ridiculous and then she pestered me and pestered me until I said oh 
God's sake, okay, I'll sign your contract. And then two years later, I finally got going and started writing it. And essentially, it's the culmination of everything that I've learned and everything Pregnant and Screwed is about. So it's about the motherhood penalty. And the motherhood penalty is the fact that mothers receive less pay, they're judged as uh, more incompetent and more distracted uh, compared to their childless counterparts. And it's all because of this bias, this implicit bias we have towards women from the point that they say they're pregnant. Um, And because of pregnancy and maternity discrimination and because all of our structures and all of our systems are still set up to favour the unencumbered worker and they're still being somebody at home doing the childcare and inevitably that's women. Yes, yes. Jodie, the other question I was asking was about the effect of the pandemic on women and it's been horrendous for all of us, for women who hasn't affected, you know, good for you and well done. But for the majority, it's men that are actually, some women have resigned from from the workplace. Have you seen that as well? Um, And from the pregnancy side, what has been the impact of the pandemic? Because of course, pregnant women can't even receive the vaccine. That's one of the issues. They can now, they can now, but they're they're having problems with accessing it. I mean, there's been so many problems and lots of them could have been avoided. And obviously the most apparent problem is the fact that in the early stages of the pandemic, you know, two or three times during lockdown, the kids were at home, Mm -hmm. whether it was school or childcare. And it's women that hoover up all of that additional work. So PricewaterhouseCoopers said that when the schools were closed, that added 31 hours of extra work a week onto a woman's schedule. That's a, yeah. That is literally another full-time job. And it is not possible to do paid work and then to add... Up 31 hours of extra work onto your week without it impacting your paid work. And so women were begging to be furloughed sadly 71 percent of them in the second lockdown were turned down when they asked to be furloughed or they were trying to reduce their hours or they were just calling in sick or they were just burning themselves out completely and it meant that the standard of their work started to deteriorate now Lots of companies have made redundancies and are continuing to make redundancies. And although this is not this is illegal, we know from research that the key criteria they're using when they're making redundancies is the standard of that person's work. And of course, the standard of women's work has inevitably deteriorated because they've been doing all of this additional unpaid work. So um, we are seeing women, mothers in particular losing their jobs at a rate of knots. I mean, it's terrifying how many women are falling out of the workforce. And actually overall, more men have left the workforce than women. But when you break the data down by age, uh, that age between 25 to 34, it's frightening how many women have lost their jobs. And and 60% more women of that age range have lost their jobs, um, certainly towards the end of 2020, than men aged between 34 to 40. So um, that's the age when women have young kids, of course. Wow. Wow. And we're also seeing, you know, if you compare it to 2008 and the economic crash, the number of women who've lost their jobs, it's more than 78%, I think, more women have lost their jobs during the economic crash of 2008. So, So... a lot of our work has been about women calling us saying I'm being pushed out of my job and I think it's because I'm pregnant and I think or I think it's because of my caring responsibilities. Our research in July with 20,000 mothers found that 15 percent of mothers say they either had to be made redundant or expected to be. And just over half said the reason they're being made redundant is because of childcare issues. So they know why they're being pushed out. And that's illegal. It's completely illegal. But it's so hard to prove, as I'm sure you know. And and as we know, fewer than 1% of women who experience discrimination even raise a tribunal claim. Yes. But they're not, they they feel unable to use the justice service for a variety of reasons. So we're seeing a generational rollback in maternal employment that's pretty much inevitable. And that is really bad for the economy. It's really bad for families. It's really bad for child poverty. 
and obviously it's really bad for gender equality. So that that's the first thing. And we we saw our advice lines received. We've had a 450% increase in the number of calls over the last year. Wow. And so the key calls we've had have been redundancy. And the second one has been health and safety, pregnant women at work. So when the pandemic was first announced, no, first announced, that's not right. But when the when lockdown was you yeah. know, on the cards and the government on the 16th of March put pregnant women into the vulnerable category, they never said what that meant. They didn't explain what that meant for pregnant women who have jobs and were going out to work. So we were dealing with frantic pregnant women calling us saying, what does that mean? Does that mean I should go to work tomorrow? Does that mean I should get on the tube? Does that mean, like, what does that mean for me? And we didn't know at first and we unpicked it all. And so we had, you know, a clear response for pregnant women about what they should and they shouldn't do. But our, we were researching it all the way through what is actually happening on the ground. And what we found was that um, in the first lockdown lots of pregnant women were suspended from work because they've been put in the vulnerable category but the majority were suspended on the wrong terms so it was no pay they were told to take holiday they were suspended on sick pay and that was more likely to happen if you were black asian or ethnic minority you were more likely to be suspended on the wrong terms but also we found that a very high number of pregnant women were having direct contact with patients who could have COVID-19 either in care homes or in hospitals and again it was higher for black Asian or ethnic minority women they were more likely to be placed in dangerous situations working directly with patients who could have COVID-19. So we were really worried and nobody was doing anything about this. The government just sort of washed their hands of it. It felt like it took nine months before they issued specific guidance for pregnant women in the workplace. Nine months. You could have had a baby in that time. And so we were really worried and we were doing everything we could to raise awareness of it. And then in April 2020, Mary Adjie Pong, 20 year nurse, tragically lost her life. And I still struggle to talk about it now, but it, I mean, it broke us. Like it really, really did break us because, I mean, Mary is emblematic of everything that went wrong to me. A black pregnant woman in the prime of her life who spent her entire career caring for others and making sure they were okay, lost her life because nobody was protecting her. And looking after her and uh, I mean it yeah it was it was horrible when now thankfully we work with her husband Ernest who's a wonderful incredible human being um, and he and he works with us on a campaign to continue to try and keep pregnant women safe yeah um, and she was only 30 I mean oh god we're both feeling quite emotional because I remember the night that that was on the news photographs of her in a graduation dress and just all awful that you know one did think crikey this is awful and there is no protection um mm. and so i can you know when you said it broke you i i, I really concur with that I, I can just feel it and just to think about uh you know her because the baby did survive though yeah the, the daughter mary they've named her mary. oh the name of mary oh but she had a two-year-old as well two-year-old son um and I mean, yeah, I, I, Ernest told me that the son still asks when she's coming home and he, he can't, he's, well, he certainly, when we last talked about it, said he still ha- couldn't bring himself to tell him what had happened. He just would keep saying, oh, mummy's at work. And then, oh, I mean, yeah. Gosh, I know. So, well, perhaps it's a good time to just ask you about well-being you know some of these cases are uh, I know I'll put my hand up and we can all do better for our well-being but I you know I work long hours have three children uh, probably drink too much Prosecco when I can 
uh, not walk the dog enough. So I wonder where you're dealing with quite a highly emotive situation. It's very different to, you know, being a barrister, isn't it? You're dealing directly with those who are affected and are calling up, you know, and you're already getting emotional about Mary's case. How do you keep grounded? What do you do for your own well-being just to just look after yourself whilst campaigning on this important issue? Uh, to be honest, Sally, I'm probably not the best person to ask because I haven't learned how to deal with it at all. And when everything first started happening, I just stopped sleeping. <laughs> I stopped sleeping. I was working constantly and I burnt myself out and I burnt my colleague out. And I just couldn't stop. And I think in part it was because I said to myself, and this is obviously true, I'm incredibly lucky. I'm incredibly privileged. I have two healthy children. I have a job that is paying me a wage. I have a partner who has an income. I live in a house with a garden. I'm safe at home. I'm white. I'm privileged. I need to do something positive for the people that aren't in as lucky a position as I am. And all of that is obviously true. But at the same time, I think because I kept saying that to myself, I didn't stop and I didn't look after me yeah. and I did burn myself out. And, you know, in probably May, it wasn't actually, I mean, Mary really knocked me for six and it took me a while to pull myself together again after that. Um, but I, I did have moments where I just, cry you know for hours and not know what was wrong with me um and yeah you, I mean you've got to you have to you absolutely have to look after yourself and I've got a bit better I exercise try and do a bit of exercise every day and that really helps um or take a walk um and I I don't look at any screens after 8 p.m I have that rule now so no screens at all after 8 p.m and that really helps as well so it's little things I think make a really big difference but you've got to sleep haven't you if you're not sleeping yes. which is what oh, gosh, yes and it was just you know perpetual problem um and so I had to get my sleep back on track and uh that meant you know having a bath doing exercise not looking at screens after 8 p.m all that really really helped absolutely absolutely Julie um you're not a qualified lawyer but i kind of feel like you've become a lawyer by virtue of you know knowing the quality act looking at the um, covid regulations as they became and all this law that you've been uh, reading for so long to, to to bring um challenges if you like you know looking at um uh, discriminatory legislation but you're a campaigner and i wondered one if you wish you were a lawyer uh, and two, barrister or solicitor, um, what advice you'd give to a, a young person wanting to get into the law? That's an interesting question. I um, have learned along the way lots of information um, about uh, the Equality Act and employment law that has been incredibly useful with the work that we've been doing. And I have a very good friend called Danielle Ayres, who's a, a legal partner at Gorvin's. And she, I met with her at the beginning of Pregnant Learn Scrooge. We, act, we, met, we met up in Manchester after accidentally meeting on Mum's Net. It's a long story. I, I'm not a usual contributor to Mum's Net, but we accidentally met on Mum's Net. We went for a cup of tea and I asked her if she'd help me set up a free legal advice line for Pregnant Learn Scrooge. <laughs> Right. She said, yes. And I couldn't quite believe it. I thought she'd had too many coffees and um, she's still going. We've still, yeah. her. she's brilliant. So, she was at Gorvin's. She's still at Gorvin's. I've not spoken to her for a while. Yeah. She's still at Gorvin's. Yeah. Um, she's just an absolute <laughs> joy to work with. She's really funny and um, she cares, you know, she genuinely cares. Um, but she has a tough job and um, I don't envy her at all. So I no, I'm not sure I would want to be an employment lawyer because I like what I do in that it it touches on lots of different aspects. I quite like, you know, I get bored quite easily and not that it's not boring being an employment lawyer, but I like to do writing and I like to talk to parliament and I like to support women who've got problems. I'm enjoying the spread of what I do. Yes. Um, and in terms of advice, uh, for somebody who wants to get into employment law, I mean, I would say, you know, got to get experience, haven't you? You need really, you need to not only be, you know, trying to work within an employment law firm, but working, we, we have advice lines that people contact and um, the diversity 
of requests and questions that we get is fascinating. And so having a broad understanding, not just of your area of law, but all the many challenges that people are genuinely really experiencing on the ground is, I would say, really important to be a really good lawyer. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Well, in, in different sectors, sectors as well, isn't it? Different specialisms too. That experience is crucial. So, Jodie, what would you say or what advice would you give to a woman of childbearing age? You know, what, what should they really know? I gave a seminar uh, earlier this week, um, as I record and I was saying, it's important for people to enjoy maternity leave. But if work is your hobby, then you will feel like you've lost your identity when you're on maternity leave because all you have is to care for a child. Mm -hmm. But that is a job in itself. And we need the opportunity to do that job well. So the idea of, you know, discriminatory practices that stops uh, people being employed by virtue of being pregnant is just uh, abhorrent to me. But it still happens. So what, what would you say in terms of rights? So I often say to my mentees who are of a certain age and are thinking about families, you know, about how long you know they want to be a partner but equally they want to have a baby uh, and so we spend a lot of time talking about maternity rights accrued rights blah 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 timing and so on and so forth so what advice would you give to a childbearing woman particularly about knowing their rights and um, well i would say read up get to know your rights because if you are if you face discrimination in the workplace if you know your rights, it's so powerful. And as soon as you feel that the environment's changing and your employer is behaving differently towards you or they're doing something that kind of straddles discrimination law, if you make it very clear that you know your rights and that they better not screw with you, the likelihood is they'll stop. And we see that time and time again, when people call our advice lines and they tell us what's going on and we give them the information that they need and they use that information, they will come back and say, oh, it's all okay. They've stopped doing it or they've reinstated my job or they've given me that pay rise that they said they would. And I think, I mean, it doesn't always work, of course, but in the majority of cases it does. And I think employers just think that they can get away with that sort of behavior but you know as soon as you make it clear that they can't then then things change so get to know your rights if you feel that you're facing discrimination document absolutely everything um try and have a conversation with your employer if you feel that you can do about what you're experiencing about how you feel um because as well as um showing that you know your rights and that making them often back off sometimes employers I think feel really awkward if you say you're pregnant. They don't really know how to deal with it. And that awkwardness can lead them to do things like alienate you from meetings or give you lower personal development reviews that they would have done otherwise. So if you try and have a really open dialogue with them about how you're feeling, then again, that can make a positive difference. But document everything. And if it continues, contact us and we can talk you through what your rights are and also contact ACAS. That's always my advice on discrimination. But more broadly, I would say if you're of childbearing age and you want to protect your career, there's lots, there's so many different things to think about. Um, you know, childcare, we have the second most expensive childcare system in the world. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do about childcare? Can you afford it? And um, will, you know, will you have family that can perhaps support you? Does it mean that you'll need to work fewer hours for your employer? If so, what kind of flexible working policies do they have in place? Um, and also think about shared parental leave. If you are with a partner and you're both eligible for shared parental leave, then use it because that will that's the biggest protector of your career is you know if it makes we know from research that the more time dads take out to care for their children the higher women's salaries are overall they do better in their careers overall so think about using shared parental leave as well fantastic i was just going to come to shared parental leave and my question really is about the uptake the uptake is better but it's been so poor for ages. It was at one point four or something ridiculous. Now it's gone up to three, I think, when I last checked. Why do you think that the uptake here in the UK is not great? And because uh, I see it changing now after we've had this period at home with the COVID lockdown, you know, more men 
will, you know, have enjoyed the time at home with the children, getting a little bit more involved. And so I see perhaps that it will change in the uptake um, in a work-life balance. But I just wondered what your thoughts were on, on why it is, the uptake has been so dismal. I mean, shared parental leave is a completely failed system set up by the coalition government. It's um, most most couples are not eligible for it. So you're not eligible for it if you earn below a certain threshold. You're not um, eligible for it if you're self-employed. There's loads. There's I think it. I mean, don't quote me on this, but I think it's around only 25 percent of couples are actually even eligible for shared parental leave before you then move into the fact that it's not shared parental leave. It's shared maternity leave it requires a woman to give away a portion of her maternity to her partner for it to work and also the finances don't stack up partly because often the man in the relationship will earn the most money Uh, so him reducing his uh, income to 151 pounds a week has a negative impact on the whole family's finances but also in most companies if they get offer enhanced maternity pay they very rarely also offer enhanced paternity yeah so uh, again women and you know sort of by the very nature of the system it's them that take the time out to care for their children and we know because other countries have shown us repeatedly the only way you make paternity leave work is by ring fencing it and properly paying it so if you look at all the countries that have done that sweden did it in the 70s (laughs) so we have enough data to know that it works Um, then you see men take time out to care for their children in their droves. And we know that men want to. They really want to care for their kids. They really want to spend more time with them. 85% of dads said they'd do anything to spend more time with their children. So this is about men not wanting to care for their children. It's a failed system. And what the government did, rather than fix the system, was spent millions of pounds on promoting a failed system. I know, I know. I saw it. It was all over the underground, everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> millions they spent, which is literally the definition of polishing a turd. I mean, it makes no sense. Just fix the system so that it works for families. There is another issue there, which is that I represent a lot of men who, when they go to ask for the paternity leave, are often uh, met with this response. Are you not taking your career seriously? So there is an issue and a, a work to do with the workplace culture, which responds to a man saying, well, actually, I'd like to you know, take advantage of the shared parental. Firstly, they go and ask for the policy. You know, people struggle to find it and then understand it. Then they find it. Uh, and then they're met from the employer saying, oh, not taking your career seriously. And they say, well, yeah, I yeah, am. I just want to take advantage of this. Yeah, men are much more likely to face discrimination if they ask for yes. working on shared parental leave compared to women. In fact, men are much more likely to have a flexible working request rejected compared to women. And that's all because of these deeply entrenched gender stereotypes, which tell us it should be the woman at home caring for her kids. And so, of course, if a dad asks for it, then he seems not committed to his job. Whereas for women, it's sort of, you know, more expected. But that's creating lots of the problems we see with gender equality because it's not encouraged by employees. And it's because most companies are run by old white men. That's the way things were when they were younger. You know, they this is all very new to them. And so, I mean, I do think things will progress and get better because that old guard. Yes. Yeah. New guard will come in and uh, parents of my generation and the next generation seem much more keen on proper proper equality in the home or certainly doing striving towards better equality in the home um but yeah you're right I mean we've had some terrible stories from men you know there was a man who told us that he was on shared parental leave and his boss used to email him and start the email hello nanny and there was a guy who told me he'd uh, requested shared parental leave and his boss said, shall I get you a dress while you're at it? You know, they're just just these ridiculous comments. And and it's so complicated. The shared parental leave system is so complicated. Yeah. Used people can't figure it out. I mean, I tried to cover it in the book and even by the end of it, my brain was boggled. It's so <laughs> complicated that I've, that most people give up when they try yeah. and the HR yeah. departments don't understand it, so they can't help. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. I know. 
you know, I'm a barrister and I work with a lot of solicitors. And I just wonder, how can lawyers help? And what's next for you and the campaign? How can lawyers help um, in your work, really, um, whether as advisors or helplines? I know you've got brilliant, Danielle. Um, but what, what can we do to help um, in this area that you're um, brilliantly campaigning in? So for people who are uh, lawyers and and human beings, the, the things that you can do to help, I always say, are firstly, I mean, read the book. Yes. <laughs> Talk about this with, um, with friends and family as much as you can, because you'd be surprised how many people have swallowed the patriarchal pill and don't, you know, have some really weird and wonderful ways of looking at things. So it's always good to have these conversations as much as possible. Uh, with other people, you know, donate to campaigns like ours um, and support. When we're campaigning, we often ask people to write to their MP, so get to know your MP um, and talk to them about the key issues that we really care about, which are childcare, paternity leave, flexible working. Those are our top three. And access to justice is also incredibly important. Um so we're always running campaigns about this and we ask people to to contact their MPs and get to know your MP. Hopefully you'll have an MP who doesn't have a completely different worldview like I do. Um, and I mean, and I always say, if you have boys, talk to them about being a dad. Talk yeah. to them about what their hopes are for being a father. We don't have conversations with boys like that. And model gender equality in the home for your children. Make sure you're sharing the domestic load at home because if they see it, your kids see it, they're more likely to implement it when they get older. In terms of lawyers, we have, so our advice line is, um, we have a triage service at the moment. So the first people that you will speak to are HR, uh, people that are trained in HR to CIPD level seven or above. And then if you need an employment lawyer, it's passed on to Danielle and her team to deal with. Um, we are looking at ways of expanding. And so we will be announcing more ways that people can get involved very soon but i can't tell you at the moment. Uh, yeah. come on do you know somebody said to me the other day i think it was felicity garrick you see saying you get people to spill all sorts on your podcast and i was saying oh, i have clearly failed at getting you to spill um the next stage uh, of uh, the future of um Fred and then screwed but I i'm delighted to hear it and just to conclude then where do you see the campaign going then in the next few years what's next i know you can't disclose cases and so on and so forth i know a bit about some of them but uh, where do you see the campaign and you going with it i mean the, obviously the pandemic isn't over yet there's still yeah. a lot of work to do and for, the furlough scheme hasn't finished and i expect that in september perhaps even earlier we will see lots of women pregnant women and mothers being forced out of their job when that furlough scheme comes to a close so we're preparing for that at the moment there are also still lots of problems that we're constantly dealing with around the vaccine so there have been issues with pregnant women and the vaccine then being able to access it but also we feel very strongly that pregnant women should be prioritized for the vaccine because they are more vulnerable yeah. um, so we're really heavily campaigning on that at the moment once we feel like things are getting back to normal, whatever normal means, um, what we really want to do is, is utilise the pure anger and emotion that we have seen over the last year. Because women are livid. Mothers are furious. And the last thing we want to do is just move on and forget the last year happened. Because that anger is an engine that we, we need in order to ignite change. And so we will be doing, we're looking at all sorts of different ways that we can bring everybody together and harness that anger to create positive change and to get politicians to listen to what it is we now need. thank you to Jolie Brealy for Talking Law with me, Sally Penny, MBE. Please do catch up with our previous episodes where you can hear my conversations with guests such as QC's Jolien Morn, Jason Pitter QC, Felicity Gary QC, and even The Secret Barrister. 
You can find me and follow me on Twitter at SallyPenny1 or search for Sally Penny on LinkedIn. And do follow the Women in the Law UK page on LinkedIn and Instagram. And don't forget the extensive resources for anyone working within the law are available at womenintheLawUK.com. Thank you to our production team, Sam Walker and Michael Blades at What Goes On Media. Bye for now.